faith. And our family has had an absolute blast here being with you, exploring the beauty of Snowmass and of Aspen. But I can tell you what, we would rather be nowhere else than right here with you this morning, right now, because we believe God's going to move in a powerful way. Now, uh, I'm going to pray in just a moment for the message that we're about to hear. But I also want to share with you the warmest of greetings from my senior pastor, the senior pastor of Willow Creek Community Church, Bill Hybels, uh, from my congregation in Crystal Lake. Uh, we are all thrilled to be able to be a part of the body of Christ with you. And uh, why don't we pray right now and ask God to be with us in these moments. God, the scripture that we just heard, it's a story that you want us to enter into. So would you remind us right now that biblical truth is completely and utterly useless unless it's applied. But it's priceless when it's practiced. So would you work through my little mind and heart to be able to speak your truth to this incredible congregation who wants so desperately to flesh out their faith in Christ. God, that's what we want to do. We want to be the body of Christ in this community so that the world could understand and know hope and life and grace and peace. So we're trusting in you to move in us in these next few moments. In the name of Christ, we pray. Do you agree with this prayer? Would you say? Amen. Amen. Thanks. All right, now i got to tell you a little bit of a story that's going to not really paint me in the best of light, to be honest with you, okay? But it's going to help us, I think, to be able to engage this particular story. Our basement is the least favorite part of our house. It's cold, it's unfinished, it's poorly lit, it's empty, just a couch and some Christmas decorations. But we're fixing up our house to sell it, and so I needed to do a few things that were on a quite long to-do list to get it ready to sell. I needed to paint the basement stairs. How many of you have ever painted a staircase before? Uh-huh, not too many of you. Some of you, right, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you maybe experienced what I experienced this very first time, but it was a little bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be. It's 1030 at night, all right? I'm in my T-shirt and boxers, and I think, you know, I can just knock this out in 20 minutes. And so I grab a can of paint, I grab a brush, and I start painting at the top of the stairs. And so I'm painting, <laughs> and I'm going down, and I see these cracks in the wood. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to just start, start throw it on a little bit thicker, right, so that I'm doing that, and I get to the bottom, and it looks really nice. I'm really proud of myself, but then I realize that I've unintentionally gotten myself stuck. How many of you have ever unintentionally got yourself stuck? And I realize I have two options. I could wait until the paint dries, I could sleep on the couch, or I could call out to a higher power, my wife Annie, and ask for some help. Now, one thing you need to know about Annie is that she goes to sleep early, so by this time, She's been asleep for probably an hour and a half already, and so I think, I dare not wake her up because you do not want to wake my wife up when she's already asleep. And so I think to myself, I can get myself out of this mess. I can get unstuck from this all in my own power. And so what I decided to do is, I'm in bare feet, so I just kind of take a, one stair up. I have a, a, a paintbrush that's loaded with paint. I just kind of bend down and hit it, then take another step and hit it. And if you've ever seen Bambi, you remember uh, when he was trying to walk on the ice and his feet would just kind of go out like that? Well, that's what's happening. So now I'm getting paint on the sides of the walls I'm going up. I told you this is not going to paint me in a flattering light. And I'm realizing this isn't working. So I kind of scoot up my way down, and then I just sit on the paint can with my feet in the air, and I just call out to my wife. And she's on the third floor. I'm in the basement, so I have to really cry out for her to be able to hear me. Eventually she hears me, and she comes down and says, what? And here's her husband in all his glory, <laughs> sitting on the paint can with his feet in the air with gray paint all over his feet. And I say, honey, can you please help me? What am I supposed to do? I said, well, can, can, you, can you at least throw me a, a, a damp towel so I can wipe my feet off and figure a way out? And she says, just sleep on the couch. I'm like, I don't want to sleep on the couch. So she eventually throws me a towel, and I say, you know, I think the only way out is for me to actually climb out the window. We have little windows in the basement. It's not a walk-out basement. And she says to me, you're never going to fit out the window. Now it's a challenge, okay? It's also zero degrees outside in Chicago. And so I actually made my way out the window up around through the snow, up on the deck, and she lets me in. Now, all kidding aside, have you ever painted yourself into the basement? Seriously, have you ever put yourself in a situation where you unintentionally found yourself stuck? Stuck in a position of lesser living? See, I realized that while I was downstairs that upstairs was abundant life. Downstairs it was dark, it was cold, it was lonely. Upstairs was the refrigerator. Upstairs was my bed. Upstairs was my wife, my family. Upstairs was abundant life. Downstairs it was dark, 
cold and dreary? Have you ever painted yourself into a corner? Have you ever found yourself stuck in a position of lesser living where it's cold, where it's lonely, where it's dark? Maybe you find yourself in that place right now. You feel stuck on the work front? Do you feel stuck on the school front? Do you feel stuck on the home front? Is it time for supernatural intervention in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your closest relationships? Well, let me ask you this question. Where and how specifically, and please be specific, because if it's not specific, it's not going to be dynamic. Where in your life specifically, where and how do you want to see God reach down and rescue you? Would you think about that just for a moment before we go any further? See, I believe that God wants something supernatural to happen in your life, in your family, in your closest relationships today. More importantly, God believes that. God wants you to believe that too. And so in the story that we just read, Peter's prayer is what lights the fuse of God's intervention. Prayer. Prayer. No amount of education, no amount of strength, no amount of resourcing, no amount of influence, no amount of connections will make up for a failure to pray in our lives. And here's Peter. Peter of all people. And he's stuck in a storm. And he asks God to move. But he doesn't just ask him, does he? No, he doesn't. He cries out. Peter just calls out for help at the top of his lungs. Lord, save me. Now, he knew that he had two options in being stuck. He could either go under and he could drown, or he could call out to a higher power. The only one, and he knew it, the only one that was capable of lifting him out of his sorry circumstances and unstucking him. And that was the day that Peter learned this incredible lesson that he would never forget. Believe me, he never forgot this. And may we never forget it too. And it's this. When you call out to God in a situation, God comes into that situation. When you call out, God comes in. So Peter cries out to God. He prays. And then, I don't know if you caught it, but the very next word in the story is so beautiful to me. It says, Jesus immediately reaches out his wonderful, not yet scarred, but ever so strong hand, and he rescues Peter. So what's your storm right now? Where are you stuck? Is it some marital conflict? Is it financial trouble? Is it job stress? Is it an illness? Is it ingratitude? Is it irritability with your kids? Maybe it's just looking for new hope. Maybe you're here right now. You're just looking for new hope. You're looking for new life, either for you or for somebody that you love. Well, for the rest of our time together, let's learn how to pray, how to talk with God in a way that sparks something supernatural in your life, in your home, in your family, in your marriage, in your workplace, wherever. Because when you call out, God comes in. But how do you call out? Anybody wonder that? How do you really pray? Well, Scripture is so clear with us about this. First of all, it's with boldness. With boldness. Say boldness with me, will you? Boldness. Say it, say it boldly. Boldness. boldness. Scripture tells us that if we approach God's throne with boldness and confidence, that we will receive mercy to help us in our time of need. It's a throne that's called grace. That's where we're supposed to go. Well, we're supposed to go with boldness. Now, one of the best books on prayer that I've read recently is called The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. And uh, I'm indebted to him for some of the ideas that I want to pass along to you today. And I want to encourage you to read it if you're looking to go deeper in this topic. Uh, in this particular book, he, he shares a story that comes out of the Jewish Mishnah. And it's called The Legend of Honi. Uh, Honi was a very elderly Jewish man living in the first century B.C. And he was widely known as a sage and a prayer warrior. And right now, when the people are coming to Honi, Israel is just, they're stuck. They're stuck in a horrible one-year drought, and it's actually threatening to erase the people. And so the people from the town, they go to his house, and they bang on his door, and they say, hey, would you pray for us? Would you pray that God would send rain? And they literally take him, and they carry him into Jerusalem, into the center of the city. And that's when it happens. Honi, he takes his staff that he's walking with, and he just draws a little circle around himself like this. And then he kneels down in the middle of that circle, holding onto his staff. And then he prays this short power prayer. He says, Lord, I will not leave this circle until you send rain for your people. I will not leave this circle until you send rain for your people. And the legend has it, in that moment, 
it begins to just pour. So much so that there's just this torrent flowing by his knees and flowing by the people. And he just stays there and continues to pray for more and for more rain. And that little short power prayer that he prayed expressed his great faith in God. And that's what caused him to be known as Tony the Circle Maker. And that little bold prayer that he prayed became known as the prayer that saved a generation. Now, that's just, when I heard that story for the first time, it was so captivating to me. I don't know about you, but I want my prayers to be like that, don't you? I want my prayers to be so bold and to express such faith in God that they'd save a marriage, that they'd save a family, that they would save a generation, don't you? And that's exactly what Tony does. Tony was known for his simple, bold prayers and his faith in God to move. And it made me think about all the other prayers in Scripture, and even the one that we thought, heard this morning, we're thinking about right now, with Peter, just short prayer, three words, Lord, save me. Now, Batterson, talking about this, he boils it down this way. God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. So I wanted to ask you, what if you drew bold prayer circles around that area where you're stuck in your life, in, in ways that if God really answered, it would honor God? I mean, just a Draw circles just to get on your knees and just to call out. I'm telling you, when you call out, God comes in. So what if you drew circles around that drought in your marriage? What if you drew circles around that debt that's just crushing you right now? What if you drew circles around that storm in your job or that decision about whether to move or some challenge that you're facing or that sin that you're secretly battling against or your dreams for your family? What if you drew circles? Batterson writes, the bigger circle we draw, the better, because God gets more glory. The greatest moments are the miraculous moments when human impotence and divine omnipotence intersect. And they intersect when we draw a circle around impossible situations in our lives and invite God to intervene. See, when you circle something in your life, when you decide to intercede until God intervenes, it just sparks something supernatural in God's heart and then in your heart, your life, your family. But you got to call out got to call out. And maybe, maybe doing that starts with admitting that your self-reliance isn't paying the rent anymore. The truth is it never really was. But I just want to save you some tuition here and repeat what I have learned the hard way. Shared it with you in the beginning. No amount of X, all right, just fill in the blank. No amount of X will ever make up for a failure to pray. Because all those things that you could fill the blank in that are apart from God, all those things are natural things. And if you are truly stuck and looking for something supernatural, looking for God to break through, then it's time to pray bold prayers and to trust him to do what only he can do. But maybe let's think about it from another angle. What if you don't draw a circle around any of those things? Well, there's a, a school of philosophy that's become popular in the last 40 years, and it's called counterfactual theory. And counterfactual theorists try to determine cause by asking what-if questions that are counter to what actually happened in history. So take my own life personal example here to help us understand counterfactual theory. I would ask the question, what if I had not bombed the law school admissions test? What if I had not bombed the LSAT? See, I scored poorly on the LSAT, which put me in the bottom bracket, which kept me from going to Notre Dame Law School, which is where my father went. I really wanted to go there, which threw me into a depression, which made me hit rock bottom, which made me reflect on my life decisions and choices, which made me call out to God for grace, which made me go to Moody Bible Institute Graduate School, which is where I met my wife, Annie, and then we got married, and then we had George and Benjamin and Lucy and Emma. Now, not to over-dramatize things, but my kids owe their existence to my bombed LSAT. <laughs> Just think about it. What if I had aced my LSAT? A completely different life. That's counterfactual theory. Let's apply that to our passage today. What if Peter had not cried out to Jesus that morning? Would Jesus never have rescued him? Would the fishermen have become fish bait? Would the disciples never have come to the conclusion that truly this is the Son of God? What if you never pray that bold prayer that you're about to pray for your family, for your marriage, for your job, for your friend, for your mom or dad or brother or sister? What if you never pray that bold prayer? What if? See, what you do matters. When you call out, God comes in. But you have to grasp this too, because the opposite is also true. When you don't call, he don't come. This is a biblical teaching. Look at James chapter 4, verse 2. You do not have because you do not ask God. So 
So what does that say? Ask. Ask him. If you want to experience something supernatural, circle something. Because it is absolutely true. You can take this to the bank. God won't answer 100% of the prayers that you don't pray. So ask. Ask. But be sure you understand this. This is so important. God is no genie in a bottle. All right? God is not some especially attentive waiter. God is not some especially gifted musician or magician, rather. God is not heaven's customer service representative. He's God. He's your king. He's the creator. He doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. Sometimes we can get this one teaching of Jesus so mixed up and muddled up in our minds. John 14, 13. And we stop at this place. I will do whatever you ask, Jesus said. We're like, sweet. Oh, no. Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. Anybody know the rest of it? I hope it's there. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. In other words, meaning uh, not some tag that you throw on the end of the prayer that just is like uh, some chant, abracadabra, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, now it'll be done. Great, sweet. No, that's not what Jesus is teaching. He's saying, I'll do whatever you ask in my name. In other words, in, in a way that is, if you're asking something that is consistent with my will and my character, then it will be done. Why? What's the purpose of that? So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Guys, this is key when it comes to prayer. Ask with the right motives for the right things. What are those things? To advance God's will and to increase God's glory for your life, for your family, for others. See, circle prayers help you to pray with boldness. But here's the idea, other idea. They also help you to pray with persistence. See, like Honey, just refuse to move from the circle until God moves. Intercede until God intervenes. Now, some of you are thinking, well, wait, 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 Mark, that sounds a little manipulative. I mean, isn't that manipulating God? No, it's actually obeying him because it's called perseverance in prayer. This is how the Apostle Paul talked about it in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. He says, actually, he commands, pray without ceasing. I love that verse for, like, Bible memory. Pray without ceasing. This isn't a recommendation. This is a command. This is an imperative to us as followers of Christ. Pray without ceasing. Never give up about praying about something. Now, my grandmother, uh, her name was Mary. We, as the grandkids, we called her Mangy. I have no idea why. Maybe I was butchering Mary when I was a, a toddler. I'm not sure. But we called her Mangy. And she personified persistence in prayer to me. I don't know how many times. I can't tell you how many times when I was growing up and I ran into some kind of a problem, some kind of a, a challenge or difficulty, and I would go to her and I'd tell her what's going on. She would say two things to me, two words to me, every time without fail. Honey, pray. <laughs> Honey, pray pray. I got to be honest, I did not really appreciate this at the very beginning. As I got older, though, I started to see the wisdom in it because it wasn't just token advice. Maggie was inviting me into a particular kind of prayer school that I had seen her model since my grandfather has pa had passed away, since I was a very little boy. See, after my grandfather died, she devoted herself to pray for us. And prayer for her was a full-time gig. I'm telling you, I could show you stacks of letters where she'd say, this is what I'm praying for. Here, here's verses that I'm praying for you right now. But Mangy didn't just pray for things. And if I've lost you already, listen up to this, because this is probably worth the whole thing. She never just prayed for things. She would pray through things. See, Mangy didn't just pray for me. She prayed through my life and decisions and ministry and relationships and experiences. And once I left the law career track and went into seminary, she told me that she'd been praying ever since I was a baby that I would become a pastor. I'm so glad that she didn't tell me that when I was younger. It would have messed with me. <laughs> but to tell me that after God had rerouted me and graciously shattered some dreams and redirected me to be where he wanted me to be, I'm so grateful for that. Guys, I got to tell you, her prayers are still being answered in my life. She's been gone for 15 years. Mom and dad... Grandma, granddad, your prayers will still be answered in your kids' and grandkids' lives long after you're gone if they're bold prayers, if they're persistent prayers. If you're praying for that friend right now, keep praying that that prayer will make a difference in that friend's life long after you're out of that friend's life. 
So Annie and I desperately want to pass her prayer gene along to our kids, helping them to see the difference between praying for something and praying through something. Here's, here's the idea, if you didn't quite catch that. Uh, praying through something uh, means that you're praying through the entire situation. This isn't just tossing one north, okay? This isn't just a quick prayer like, okay, good, I'm glad that's over, now it's in God's hands. No, that's praying for something. That's praying for something in a moment of time and then you're done. Praying through something is when you pray through the entire situation, daily, hourly sometimes, asking God to intervene, to, to help in some major kind of way. That's what praying through is. Now, I mentioned that we were painting our basement stairs so that we could sell our house. Well, the market in Chicago, I don't know what it's like here in Snowmass or Aspen, but it's horrible. And so we knew that our house might be on the market for years. And so each day we were praying and we were just trusting God. And it was something that I had to daily kind of give up because I was getting anxious about it and we really wanted to do something uh, really strong as a family to be able to help our church find its new church home. So we're just praying about it. And so what we did is every single day, whenever we were with the kids in the car or wherever we were, we'd ask God, God, you're the one that's in control of this. You're the one that's in charge. I cannot speed this up. And I'll tell you, for a control freak, that was so hard to be in that kind of a situation. But we prayed and we asked God every day. And that was praying through it. We didn't just throw one up north, you know, the very first time we decided to put the sign in the front yard. It was praying through something. See, praying for is like saying grace for a meal. Good bread, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. Now you're done. That's praying for something, okay? It's a moment in time, and then you're done. But the most important things in life, the things that weigh heaviest on your heart, they demand a level of major league prayerfulness that comes at it from multiple angles over a long period of time. That's praying through something. Praying through is all about persistence. It's circling something so many times that you get dizzy. Now, Jesus, teaching about prayer in Luke 11, he tells a story about an almost obnoxiously persistent friend who shows up banging on his buddy's front door at 3 a.m. asking for some food. And the buddy just shouts down from his bed, no, way, go away, we're in bed ready and so are the kids. But the friend persists, Jesus says. He just keeps ringing the doorbell just over and over and over. And so finally... The buddy, not because he's a friend, but because of this guy's sheer persistence, he relents. And he gives him everything that he asks for. And then Jesus gives the moral out of this story. He says, so I tell you, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. He, he's not saying God's asleep, you better bang louder on the door, better lang, bang longer on the door. He's saying, keep on asking. That's the moral of this story. Ask, and it will be given to you. God is saying, Bang on my door in the middle of the night. I want you to persevere in prayer. I mentioned last week briefly that my parents fought. And I mean, when they fought, they, they fought, fought. They fought about religion and they fought about money, which is why those are two things that I'm not crazy about in this life. And when I saw the pain in my parents' relationship uh, when I was younger, when I was a kid, I didn't have this language. But I decided essentially not to pray for a healthy marriage for myself when I got older but to pray through a healthy marriage where we'd be on the same page spiritually and financially. And so every night from about the age of nine on, I would ask God to protect my future wife, to grow her, to use experiences in both of our lives to shape our hearts and our dreams and our hopes for one another. And now, last month, we celebrated our 20-year anniversary in marriage, Annie and I did, and I can tell you that I enjoy uh, such an incredibly godly wife, I believe because of that persistence in prayer, because of God's faithfulness in answering that prayer, one of the most gracious answers to prayer in my whole life. So guys, I got to tell you this. If you want to see something supernatural happen in your marriage, don't pray for your marriage. For God's sake, don't pray for your marriage. Pray through your marriage. If you want to see something supernatural happen in and through your church, please, for Christ's sake, don't pray for your church. Pray through your church. If you want to see something supernatural happen in your city, you getting this? Don't pray for your city. Pray through your city. See, praying through is all about heartfelt earnestness. It's not about how many hours you log. It's about how deep you go. It's so much more than words. It's tears and it's groans because your heart is in it. See, praying through something doesn't just bend God's ear. It touches his heart. When was the last time that you found yourself flat on your face in front of God? Because of the circumstances that God has led our church in over the last several years, I don't have to look too far back. The last four years, our church, which is leasing a warehouse in the outskirts of Chicagoland, 
uh, we've, we've maxed it out and we need more space, which is an awesome problem to have. But we had to look at over 80 properties over the last four years to find a permanent home. And I have to tell you, myself, our team, we were on our faces every day asking God, God, please intervene. Please provide for your church. And then after that, we had to raise the resources to be able to purchase this, $8 million to be able to purchase this land. Now we've got to raise the resources to be able to trick it out. And I'm praying every day. And then we had to go in front of the city and ask them for the right zoning to be able to use that space. And I'll tell you what, God has helped me to understand what it looks like to ring his doorbell 24-7. How about you guys? When was the last time that you lost the circulation in your feet because you were kneeling so long in prayer? When was the last time that you pulled an all-nighter begging God for something? Are you desperate enough to experience something supernatural in your family to do that? Are you that hungry to find a godly spouse? Are you that hungry for your son to make the right decisions in that relationship with that girl? Are you that hungry to become the kind of husband or wife that your spouse deserves? Are you that hungry to see your grandkids run into their future, clenching their faith baton? Well, God's that hungry. God is that hungry to do something supernatural in your family. He wants to take your family to so much higher ground in some places and so much deeper in others. Whole new levels of growth and joy and unity and purpose as a family. There are whole other new dimensions that you can't even imagine as an individual that God wants to do in your life. And he wants to take you there. A brand new, more abundant, fuller life story is just waiting for you, waiting for your family if we will just learn to ask God. I mean, do you have any idea how much God loves you and how much he longs to fulfill his promises for you? He can't wait, guys. Listen, he can't wait to delight you with his goodness. He can't wait to thrill you with his love. And I know this because over and over and over again in Scripture, we see God as a God who is willing and able to come in and do something supernatural in our lives if we would just call out. Because when we call out, God comes in. Now, uh, last year, last summer, just to to close it down, uh, I think this story will help us. Uh, last summer, uh, a friend of ours gave us tickets to be able to go to Bermuda as a couple. So Annie and I, uh, we head off to Bermuda this past summer. The first day that we get there, uh, we swam in the sound. And here are a few pictures of what the sound is. If you're not sure what a sound is, imagine a, an island that kind of wraps around like this, and it's the shallow, sheltered area inside the island that's still connected to the ocean. And it was just beautiful to me. There were conch shells, you can see, there were sea cucumbers, there were Cuttlefish, which I found out later were highly toxic, and I was swimming like an inch from them. That was awesome, though. But I'm a city guy, remember? Okay? But on the second day, uh, when we woke up, the couple that we went with, they're like, hey, why don't we go to the sea today? And I pushed back a little bit, because I'm like, why would we do that? 6 a.m., I got my flippers, my snorkel, and my mask, and I'm over there ready to jump into the sound again. It's like, there's nobody here. We got this all to ourselves. This is amazing. Let's just, let's go check it out. All right, we'll check it out, and we'll come back after lunch. All right. So when we got to the sea, I got to tell you, and here's what you're going to see. I saw colors that I had never seen before, all right? I I saw cliffs to climb up and jump off of. I saw caves to go into and to explore. I saw waves to ride, currents to fight. I saw depths to dive, colorful coral, beautiful fish, sharks. It was awesome. And I couldn't help but think as I'm in that experience, what an amazing, what an incredible analogy of life. I mean, seriously. So many of us are splashing around in the equivalent of life's puddle, which we think is great. When we could be splashing in the sea of God's supernatural activity in our lives and in our family, his goodness and grace for this generation and beyond. Friends, I'm here to tell you that he has so much more abundant life for you to be able to enjoy. And he wants to use you to unleash it into your life, your friend's life, your family's life. Get out of the basement. Get out of the storm, right? Get out of the sound. Ask. Ask him with boldness and persistence. Pray circles around people and problems and dreams. Pray through things. Pray with expectancy because God will move. And then you can declare to the entire world that he has done something supernatural in your life because then you know it when you call out. God comes in. Would you bow?
bow your heads in prayer with me, please.